We are taking this season leading up to Advent to consider the words of encouragement from God to us in this season of disruption and fatigue. I read this week that to be truly weary is a state of both body and soul. The author went on and she wrote, we know the difference between the kind of gratifying tiredness that comes from a good day's work and the burden of weariness. When hardness of life settles on us thick and leaden, the book of Ecclesiastes names the latter the weariness of the flesh. It comes with desolation, anxiety, and deep sighs of despair. So Walking the Valley is the name of this series. It is used to express the valleys of spiritual, physical, and mental exhaustion and weariness that many of us have been experiencing. Psalm 23 spoke to us two weeks ago of the reality that our lives are lived in the company of both the shepherd and the shadow. The Christian faith is not naive to the realities of the struggles of hardship, but it has persistently insisted in the face of all manners of evil and hardship that the believer never suffers or walks through this life alone, but that Jesus is the faithful shepherd who walks with us every step of the way. Last week, Greg reminded us of the promise of Isaiah that God would be our strength, that he would renew us. He would, even if our pace was moving, I love this picture, that even if our pace moves from flying to running to walking to crawling, God promises to renew our strength. Greg pointed out that the only command in Isaiah 40, 31 is simply to wait on God. I hope that you can hear in that the clear invitation from God that if this is where you find yourself, it is good to have seasons of rest, to allow God to renew your strength and build up your hope once again. And if you are not feeling weary and tired and fatigued, this is the time in which we come alongside those who are as the body of Christ to encourage and strengthen and equip. This morning, I want to focus on the comfort and good news that we have that God hears our cries. That when we cry out to God, the witness of the scriptures is that God hears us and responds. On the TV show Sports Center with Jay Onright, he has a segment uh, in the evening where he goes on a rip and he takes you through all the sports highlights from a a particular league, and he just shows you, you know, this happened in this game, and this happened in this game, and this happened in this game, and I like that image. And so I just want to take us on a rip uh, through the Psalms. Psalm 4, verse 3. Know this, the Lord takes personal care of the faithful. The Lord will hear me when I cry out to him. Psalm 5, verse 3. The Lord... Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I lay it all out before you, and then I wait expectantly. Psalm 10, 17. Lord, you listen to the desires of those who suffer. You steady their hearts, and you listen closely to them. Psalm 17. Listen to what's right, Lord. Pay attention to my cry. Listen closely to my prayer. It is spoken by lips that do not lie. 17 verse 6, I cry out to you because you answer me. So tilt your ears toward me now and listen to what I am saying. Psalm 18, in my distress I cried out to the Lord. I called to my God for help. God heard my voice from his temple. I called to him for help and my call reached his years. Psalm 34, this suffering person cried out, the Lord listened and saved him from every trouble. The Lord's eyes watched the righteous, his ears listened to their cries for help. When the righteous cry out, the Lord listens, he delivers them from all their trouble. Psalm 40, one of my personal favorites, I waited patiently for the Lord, he turned to me 
and heard my cry. Psalm 66. My mouth cried out to him with praise on my tongue. If I had cherished evil in my heart, my Lord would not have listened. But God definitely listened. He heard the sound of my prayer. Bless God. He didn't reject my prayer. He didn't withhold his faithful love from me. Psalm 145. The Lord is close to everyone who calls out to him, to all who call out to him with sincerity. Psalm 145. God shows favor to those who honor him, listening to their cries for help and saving them. As you can see, over and over again, the psalmist testify that the, those who are in trouble, God will hear them, he will listen, and he will respond. One of the ways in which we can read scripture is as a testimony, as the story of those who have gone before us, as they testify to the ways in which God has acted in the past so that we can anticipate what God will do now in our lives and in the future. And so with that in mind, I'd like us to look at the story of Hagar. Uh, Genesis chapter 16, and then Genesis chapter 21. Now, the story of Hagar is one that is troubling. It takes a careful reading. Um, there are aspects of this story that if we do not treat them correctly can seem to condone abuse or encourage people to stay in situations that are unsafe or not good for them. We might spiritualize it and miss out on the very human toll that is happening in this story. So we want to read it carefully. But we also want to see the story of one who suffered and the beauty of God in it. So let's read Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps you can have a child through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. And so Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened ten years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now she's pregnant and she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, look, she's your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Bir Lahai Roy, which means, Well, the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. And so Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. In the ancient world, barrenness was the worst possible thing that could happen to a family. The primary role of the family was to produce the next generation of people. 
And so we don't understand this today, but, but the highest value was the survival of the family. And so the ancient world had a variety of ways in which this was stipulated into marriage contracts that anticipated and solved the problem if barrenness should happen in a marriage. One option was the husband would just divorce his first wife and marry another woman who is presumably fertile. And yes, the ancient world assumed that infertility only had to do with the woman and not with the man. A second option was to take a second wife who would have equal value. And the importance of having children meant that whatever disharmony that would create within the family structure was worth it because survival of the family was of the highest importance. A third option was adoption. And there's actually a hint in Genesis that Abram was maybe thinking that he needed to do that option, that maybe adoption was going to be the way. The fourth option was called polykoity. It was the addition of handmaids or concubines for the purpose of producing an heir. This last option was usually considered the most desirable, the reason being that if you divorced your first wife, there was an economic impact to your family. The first wife would take her dowry with her and would leave, and so you would lose your cows and your money that she had brought into the marriage. And so what it seems happens in this story in Genesis 16 is Sarai pulls out the marriage contract that she and Abram have from when they got married and says, well, this isn't working. Let's do what we said we would do. And so she gives her slave, her handmaid, Hagar, to the family. A concubine brings no dowry, simply a fertile womb. This story makes me sad. I don't think there's any way to read it and not feel the abuse and the pain and the evil in the text. A careful reading, you will see that in verse 6, after Hagar becomes pregnant, it says that Sarai treats her harshly. That is the exact same word that will be used later in Exodus when the Egyptians treat their slaves harshly. It is abuse. It is not a happy story. It is not a good story. Hagar is treated oppressively as a slave master treats their slave. And so Hagar runs away. She flees into the desert. It's like when Jacob flees from Laban, or Moses flees from Pharaoh, or Jephthah flees from his brother, or Jonah flees. From God. It is a sad story. I hope that we can empathize with Hagar, feel the depths of her weariness, of her burden, of the pain that she is carrying. And yet there's also hope in this story. Verse 13 says, Therefore Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me, El Roy. She says, have I truly seen the one who sees me? It's significant, friends. The first person in scripture to name God is Hagar. A woman, a single mother, an African slave. She says, I have seen the one who sees me. God seeks her out, and he calls her by name. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar. And verse 8, the angel of the Lord said to her, Hagar. God finds this woman, used and abused, weary, a runaway African slave, and he calls her by name and is named by her. The first person to give God a name in the Bible is not Abram, it is not Sarai, it is not the great patriarch or matriarch of the faith, it is Hagar, their abused slave. And I think that's beautiful. It tells us that God listens to the cries of those who are in need, who not only hears their cries, but seeks them and finds them. And then in a relationship so intimate and close that God allows himself to be named by this person. He is named by the one 
that he saw. However, the story is really troubling. Verse 9 says, The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. I don't like that. Why is God sending her back into this place of abuse? And this is where we have to be so careful as we engage with the text, as we read it. We have to be quick that we don't draw too many lines between the story and our application today. This is not a universal blanket command for all people in all times. It is, though, a story that has been given to us, even if we don't like it. And so Hagar returns to Sarai for a time. Let's turn to Genesis 21. There's a bunch of stuff that happens in the life of Abram and Sarai, including a name change, where they now are Abraham and Sarah. And God keeps his word to Sarah, and she has her son Isaac, and there is great rejoicing for them. And and I, I don't know, I was thinking about this, how this story, we, we read the story of the birth of Isaac and we celebrate. There's laughter, there's joy, God has kept his promise, even when it, was, even when it seemed so impossible. This is so exciting. And yet there's a deep shadow side to that story. There is a, a darkness that, that actually lives in parallel to the rejoicing of the birth of Isaac. And so we read in Genesis 21, when Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, Abraham her Egyptian servant, and Hagar was making fun of her son Isaac. And so she says, get rid of the slave woman and her son. He is not going to share it with the inheritance of my son Isaac. I won't have it. And this upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy or your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendant of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water. He strapped them on Hagar's shoulder, and then he sent her away with her son. And she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. And when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. And she went and she sat down by herself a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God said to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation of his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful, skillful archer, and when he settled into the wilderness of Paran, his mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. You see... This is the story. In the story, Hagar's status begins to create friction. When she gave an heir to Abraham, she became not just a concubine, a concubine, but a wife. And so what happens is, and I quote, a woman of Hagar's status could not be expelled by either the husband or wife alone. She could not be sold. Her son had the status of a legitimate heir and would generally have to be divorced. By sending her away, both Hagar's and Ishmael's claims were being dissolved. But this meant, meant that while Hagar was being given her freedom, she was being divorced. Verse 14, when it's the Hebrew word for being sent away, is the same word that will be used later to be divorced. It, that's what the word means. Abram divorces his wife. He sends his son and wife away. And once again, God hears her cry and comes to her. So often when we think about trials, about suffering, about abuse and hardship and struggles and weariness, we turn to the story of Exodus. We turn to the stories of God's liberation of the oppressed. We hope and pray and expect that God of the oppressed, that Yahweh will eliminate the hardships of our life and deliver people from their suffering. And that's part of the reason why the story of Hagar is so troubling. 
Because God does not appear to liberate Hagar. And so I, as I was reading, I said, I need a different perspective because my own perspective as a white male can read this story incorrectly. I found a really helpful article. It was called Hagar, an African-American Lens by Emily P. Cook. In it, she quotes another woman, Dolores Williams. And, and Dolores introduces a concept of survival theology as a way of understanding Hagar's desert experience. It is a near-destruction situation in which God gives personal direction to the believer and thereby helps her make a way of what she thought was no way. So let me just read a little bit. Peacock writes, Twice Hagar entered the desert, once of her own accord when she fled from Sarah's harsh abuse, and again when she was exiled from Abraham's household with her child and forced to make a home in the desert for her small family. On both occasions, she encountered Yahweh. Each time, Hagar received a promise from Yahweh that her son would be the father of a great nation and a wild ass of a man. How can this comfort Hagar? The bottom line is that despite such divine promises, she is still alone in the desert with no food or sustenance for either herself or her son. And so Williams argues that the rest is up to Hagar at this point. God has given her the resources and the means to make it, but he will not go ahead of her and do it for her. Hagar's fight against oppression is her own, though God is there at her side to support and assist. The main difference between a liberation theology and survival strategies is that one anticipates the victory of God over oppression, the other finds strength to continue toward one's personal victory over over oppression. I find this idea of survival theology interesting because when I think about the good news that God hears our cries, I would like the response of God to be Exodus. When I cry out to God, I want miraculous signs of power, of waters parting, of our enemies destroyed as the waters collapse into them. When I cry out to God in the night, I want God to, to make mental illness vanish, cancer to be healed, relationships to be restored, freedoms of addiction, systemic racism to end. I would love for COVID to simply be something that we read about in the history books. God, we pray, part the waters, vanquish that which holds me down, make my mind, my body, my spirit that is so weary, deliver me from all that enslaves me and keeps me captive. And sometimes God does that. The exodus was the decisive liberation of the people. The resurrection of Jesus is the end of the powers of sin and death and freedom for all. Our hope is that God is renewing and restoring the world, that King Jesus will come back and make all things new, will bring a new heaven and a new earth. His reign and his rule will be complete. So sometimes God answers with great acts, and by his own strong right arm, he redeems and he saves. We know that the day is coming when it will happen again, when there will be a final sweep and King Jesus will return and there will be a final exodus moment in which we are all set free. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But let us not skip over the whole witness of God's people. Sometimes they witness of the decisive moment in which God hears the cries of the people and he takes it upon himself to free us. And other times, it's more like Hagar. And Hagar receives the strength to endure the promise that she is not alone. God sees her and she has seen God. The witness of scripture is clear. God does hear. God will come. Of this, there is uniform agreement. How God comes, how God responds, is not always the same. We have to have eyes to see. Maybe this is the time that God comes as liberator, or maybe this is the time God comes alongside us to help us survive. Hagar, David, the psalmist, the widows, the orphans, the oppressed people, they all cry out to God, and God hears them. 
the story of Hagar, we see that God does not remove her from her bad situation, but God gives her his presence. He gives her strength to endure, gives her new eyes so that she can see something that she didn't see before, like water in the desert. She is never alone. She is not left on her own strength. God hears her and responds to her and shows her how to carry on in a weary and hard world full of injustice. And so I want to leave you with these words from Isaiah 65. This is the promise of the life after the exile, the new creation life that is beginning for those of us who live and follow Jesus. God says in Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Friends, I just want to encourage you today that in whatever situation you find yourself, whatever valley you are walking through, the promise is that when we cry out, even before you cry out, God will answer and God will hear. While you are still speaking your heart out to God, God promises that he will hear. Would you pray with me? God, give us your presence like you did to Hagar. As we struggle, as we are weary, would you reveal yourself to us as the God who sees us? Would you give us the strength to endure the difficult things in our lives and the burdens we must continue to carry? God, we ask that as we wait on you, you would renew our strength. Give us the strength to survive as we wait for your full liberation and deliverance that will come with your return, King Jesus. As we walk through these valleys of life, Jesus, we pray that you would open our eyes to see the things that we need. That we would see with new eyes the water in the desert that you are providing for us. Thank you for the history of those who have faithfully walked before us, who tell us over and over again that whenever we cry out to you, you are faithful to listen and to come. And so, Jesus, I pray these words of Psalm 40 on behalf of my brothers and sisters here today. But me, I am weak and needy. Lord, think of me. You are my help and my rescuer. My God, don't wait any longer.